All right, our next speaker is Matjek Doenga, who's going to be speaking about uh, geometric functions and the enumeration of maps. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, so it's a big honor to be here. I'm very happy. Um, uh, and inside of Golden and Jackson really shaped my research. So um, I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to show you one particular conjecture of Golden and Jackson that they posed in 96. And this is a conjecture which connects different areas of mathematics. So I found it particularly beautiful. Uh, and it connects geometry, enumeration of maps, and symmetric functions. So let me start from, from a problem that was posed uh, more, than, more than 100 years ago by Hurwitz. Uh, so Hurwitz was interested in, in certain geometric problem. Namely, he wanted to count or classify branch coverings of the sphere. So uh, yesterday, Jonathan Novak mentioned this. He, he said that it's a bit scary. I would like to try to convince you that it's actually not that scary. Uh, so branched coverings, essentially, this is the same thing as, as covering, which means that in a generic point of, of a surface, the pre-image looks like a, like a copy of, of this uh, neighborhood. But there are some special points on, on this sphere. And around these special points, there is a small neighborhood such that if you look how this function, which is covering your space, look like it. Locally, it looks like z to power n. Um, so this is so this is the geometric part. And if you look at it from this point of view, it might it might look very hard. But uh, what is what is interesting for us is that Hurwitz was able to to rephrase this problem in in terms of uh, of a combinatorial problem. Namely, uh, he said that understanding these branch coverings uh, is essentially equivalent to counting tr transitive factorizations of the identity in the permutation group. So what does it mean that this is a transitive factorization? It means that the group generated by sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k acts transitively on points from 1 to n. Uh, so these are permutations of points from 1 to n. OK. so. So counting this branched covering essentially is the same as, as counting factorizations in a permutation group. So this problem looks much more combinatorial. And as combinatorialists, what we want to do to understand this enumeration, we would like to write a generating function of these factorizations. So here I have a pretty big generating function. It, it's a generating function which has infinitely many variables. In fact, it has finite, finitely many families which are infinite. Uh, and this function, it basically tracks uh, all the possible statistics that you can imagine here that are interesting from this geometric point of view. Namely, it tells you precisely what is the cycle structure of every permutation which appears in this factorization. So if you look at this generating function, it looks like that. So we sum over n. n is the size of the permutation group. Uh, this is an exponential generating function. And then we are looking at all the possible factorizations of identity as a product of k plus 2 permutations. But here, I don't have this requirement that the factorization is transitive. So I'm just looking on all possible factorizations. And then to each such a factorization, I associate variables which are telling me what is the cycle structure of each permutation. So for instance, if I'm looking at this factorization, these variables here, PIs, they will look like that. P1 um, is given by P1, P4. So, so this is a bit confusing. So P, when I say one, I mean an upper index. So this is the, th these var variables are telling me what is, the what is the cycle structure of the first permutation. So I have one cycle of length one, y cycle of length four. So the associated in the terminates are p1 and p4. And for the second one, it's p1, 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 and p2, because I have one transposition. And for the last one, I have one cycle of like length five. So this is p5. 
So this is a huge generating function. It has infinitely many variables, but it carries all the information that we want to know. Um, and then if we, if we look at the logarithm of this generating function, this function is no longer an exponential generating function, but this is a generating function of transitive K factorizations. So this is this um, standard trick that you might know in, in, enumerate, in enumerative combinatorics that if you, if you have an exponential generating function build objects, which are not necessarily connected, if you take a logarithm, this is essentially a generating function of connected and not labeled but rooted objects. So, so this is a generating function of K factorizations, modal conjugation. So basically this is like a generating function of branched coverings. So here's an example to, to check if you, if you follow this, this huge, uh, this huge um, generating function. So, so what, is the, what is the coefficient in this, in this tau A of P2, P1 to power K times PK plus two? Any ideas? So, so what should it be? So th this means that these variables look like that. It means that all these permutations are transpositions. So we want to count a factorization such that the first permutations are transpositions. And the last one is a long cycle. So, okay, so essentially up to this prefactor here, this is the same as to, as to count in how, how, how many ways I can write a long cycle as a product of K plus two transpositions. So by, Cayley, by Cayley's theorem, this is just given by K plus two to K minus one. So maybe you know Cayley's theorem more as a, as a theorem which tells you what is the number of labeled trees and not a factorization of a long cycle as a product of transpositions, but this is the same thing. And this is the first place where we are trying to go from counting permutations to counting some, which will be graphs on surfaces. So let's look what's happening in this particular case when we want to count a factorization of a long cycle as a product of transpositions. So there is a certain construction that we can, that we can do, namely whenever we have a, a factorization, we can, to, to each transposition, we can make a following picture. We draw a small vertex and we, we draw two half edges going out from this vertex and we label them according to, to the numbers that these transpositions are, that these permutations are transposing. So for instance, for the first, it's two, four. So it's this vertex, one, two, it's this one, and three, four, it is this one. And then I just add vertices with only one half edge, which will represent fixed points. So this is a, this is a permutation of four numbers. So I need to, for instance, for, for the first transposition here, three, four, I need to add one and two. And in an analogous way, doing a, I'm doing this with, with the other colors. And then I'm connecting these half edges, which has the same labels, in a way that whenever I go around a vertex, which I created uh, of label I, I always see, when I go counterclockwise, I always see first a green transposition, then a red transposition and then a blue transposition. And of course, if we have K transpositions, they are labeled. So whenever we are going counterclockwise, we're visiting them one by one. So when we do this, and when we forgot about these colors, we have a labeled tree. And this is a bijection between labeled trees and factorizations of a long cycle, a minimal factorization of a long cycle into transpositions. So this is why the Cayley number gives you precisely the number of, in how many, how many ways you can factorize a long cycle as a product of transpositions. Um, okay, 
So that was this very special coefficient. So, but what's happening in, in general? Um, so, so actually a very similar thing is happening. Namely, we want to look, now we want to look also at the special case when we have only three permutations. So we're interested in factorization of identity as a product of three permutations. And this special case is important for various reasons. So for instance, from, uh, from geometry, this is important because they correspond to something which is called Grotnendic des enfants and these branched coverings are particularly important. Uh, but from combinatorial point of view, I will show you that this corresponds to a very nice combinatorial object, namely bipartite maps. So bipartite maps will be bar bipartite graphs, which are embedded into surfaces. And the construction between factorization of, a, of an identity as a product of three permutation and these graphs works pretty much the same way as previously. So, um, so here is an example. So I have a, I have a, a product of three permutation and I index them by a black dot, white dot, and this square. This is because they will cor correspond to black vertices, white vertices in my, in my map and faces. And I'm basically, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing as before. So, so for each, for, for each cycle of sigma black dot, I draw um, a vertex and then going clockwise around this vertex, I'm visiting the numbers which are in the cycle. And I do exactly the same thing with white vertices. And then again, I'm connecting, I'm connecting half edges which have the same labels and okay, so what, what I have, if I do this, is a bipartite graph, but because these, uh, these half edges around vertices, they are drawing in a very particular way. In fact, the way of drawing it also says that, that, that there is an additional structure. It's not only a graph, but this is a graph which might be embedded into a surface. And the way we did it, it defines this embedding. Uh, and how does it define? It defines in a way that now I can, I can somehow visit this graph walking around it. So you can imagine that you're a little ant and, and these edges is a huge wall. So you are just walking so, so, so that you're, you're keeping an edge as a wall on your right hand side and you want to explore everything. So for instance, if I start here, I'm walking like that. I'm walking like that here, then I'm here, 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 and then I'm back. So this defines an embedding of this graph into a surface. And this last permutation here, it can be actually read from this picture in the following way. So if I start from, uh, from one and I will follow, um, my, my graph and I will read every second label. What I read is precisely this permutation. So we can try. So I start with one. So I'm reading it's one. Then I don't read it. Then it's two. I don't read it. It's three. I don't read it. It's four. I don't read it. And it's five and I'm back. So this means that the product of these two permutations is a cycle one, two, three, four, five, and phases of, of this embedding, they correspond to cycles of this third permutation. So, so the definition of a map, again, is a graph which is embedded into a surface such, such that it cuts the surface into simply connected pieces, which are called faces. And in this case, this is a labeled map because all the edges of my map have associated labels. And this construction is exactly a correspondence between labeled maps and factorization of an identity as a product of three permutations. Um, and this, this condition of transit, this transitive condition, it has a very nice, 
it has a very nice description in terms of maps. Namely, it means that our map is connected. So transitivity is the same as to say that the map is connected. Uh, and finally, the last thing is that I said that when we look at this generating function, if we take logarithm, uh, we are counting uh, no longer labeled maps. So now we are counting maps such that only one edge is fixed and we can forget about all the other labels. And, and this, this is called a rooted map. And for a purpose of this talk, I actually prefer to, to change this definition Namely, instead of fixing one edge, I prefer to, to orient, distinguish and orient the corner. Um, this will be important because I will be also interested in maps on not necessarily orientable surfaces. So I actually, I didn't say that yet, but this is very important. So this construction is a construction between factorizations of an identity and orientable bipartite maps. So these maps will be always orientable. Okay, so, the, so a small summary of what I said so far is the following. So, so if we look at this generating function that I showed you at the beginning, you can think that this is a generating function of orientable, labeled, and possibly disconnected maps. And this is an exponential generating function. And these three set of variables, they give you a very nice statistic of these maps, namely the first uh, family of variables corresponds to the degrees of black vertices. The second one tells you what are the degrees of white vertices. And the last one is telling you what are the degrees of the faces because it's bipartite, the degree has to be divided by two. And now if we take this generating function, so we take a logarithm and, we, and uh, TDDT, uh, then, this is no longer exponential generating function. This is just a generating function of orientable and rooted and connected maps. So, so this, is, this is a connection between maps and counting factorizations uh, of an identity in the permutation group. But there is another very nice connection and it's a connection with symmetric functions. So, um, we already saw a definition of sure symmetric functions. I will show you a slightly different definition. Usually people might, might complain that this is maybe not a good definition. This is more like a property of, of sure symmetric functions, but for my purposes, uh, I prefer to, to define sure symmetric functions like that. So, so PI is a power sum symmetric function. So this is this very, very simple symmetric function. And chi lambda is a character of the irreducible representation of the symmetric group indexed by lambda. And then you can define sure symmetric function as a, you can, you can define it by saying, what is its expansion in power sum symmetric functions? And the coefficients are, are given by, by characters of irreducible representations of the symmetric group. So as I said, this is not a standard definition, but this definition has a very nice consequences for, for, our, for us. Namely, if we are interested in, in counting the, the coefficients of an identity in a product of, of, uh, of uh, permutations, and this is what, what we were doing so far, uh, we can use representation theory to do this. So, so if I denote C mu, a, a conjugacy class of permutations of cycle type mu, then one way to, to count uh, in what is the number of factorizations of identity as a product of permutations with a fixed conjugacy class is, is actually to, to look to, by definition, this is just the left-hand side of this equation. Uh, and we can use Frobenius character formula to, to compute this number. And, and it is given by this formula. So you sum over all irreducible representations of the symmetric group and, and you compute uh, these characters. So if we know this Frobenius character form formula, then basically for free, we have a very nice formula for this tau function in terms of sure symmetric functions. So, so you can see that this tau functions from which, from which we started, it turned out that actually this is a partition function of a product of sure symmetric functions. 
modulo some normalization factor. Um, and this is a so this is a new connection between between the theory of symmetric functions and uh, and this uh, enumerative problems from which we started. Um, okay, so so here is a very natural question. So if you if you like this geometric objects, namely maps, uh, it is very natural to ask. So what about other surfaces? Uh, so of course there are orientable surfaces, but there are also non-orientable surfaces. So the question is, is, is it possible to use a similar theory uh, to, deal, to deal with non-orientable non -orientable maps? Um, and the answer is yes. So, so on the representation theory side, um, we no longer use a representation theory of the symmetric group, but now we, we should look at, uh, at the representation theory of something which is called the Gelfand pair of the symmetric group of two n uh, variables in hyperoctahedral subgroup. Uh, so this part was uh, it's it's something that was studied by Hanlon, Stembridge, and Stanley. Um, they so they, they didn't they didn't use the terminology of maps. Um, they they showed that there is another nice uh, combinatorial interpretations in terms of matchings. But then the insight of Golden and Jackson was that actually you can use matchings to encode bipartite maps on arbitrary surfaces, which might be orientable or non-orientable. Um, and then using, using this theory and the theory of symmetric functions, it turned out that the zonal polynomials play the analogous role of the, as the sure symmetric functions played to count orientable maps. Um, so, so okay. So we can, if we, if we're interested in generating function of all maps, all bipartite maps, namely by all I mean they can be either orientable or non-orientable, and we want to track the same statistics. So degrees of black vertices, degree, uh, degrees of white vertices, and degrees of faces. Um, it turned out that actually the generating function can be written in terms of zonal. Uh, symmetric functions. So this was a beautiful of Golden and Jackson, and and this is just the beginning of the story. So so now so this is a summary. So we have these two generating functions. So the, the, the first generating function is a generating function of orientable maps, and the second one is the generating function of non-oriented maps. So they 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 might be orientable or non-orientable. Um, Okay, and, and, and they, they're written like that. So, so if you're an expert in symmetric functions, and if you, if you stare on these formulas for a moment, you might recognize that actually these two symmetric functions are, are special instances of a more general family of, of symmetric functions. And this is called the Jack, Jack symmetric functions or Jack polynomials. So Jack polynomial, is a, it's a symmetric function which has additional parameter, parameter alpha. And if you are not an expert in symmetric functions, um, don't worry, I have a quick crash course on Jack polynomials. So, um, so the way to think about Jack polynomials is that they're obtained by gram schmidt orthogonalization process applied to monomial bases. With respect to a certain scalar product, which which in a natural way uh, uh, generalizes a, a scalar product for for, for which uh, sure polynomials are orthogonal, so so this this scalar product it it basically it changes by adding this this parameter alpha here, and then you can think that Jack polynomials are. You, you just have your scalar product, you apply gram schmidt orthogonalization process, and this is what Jack polynomials are. Of course, this definition doesn't tell you too much about, about these polynomials, but okay. Um, so this is what they are. So, so now, so okay, I'll show you back. So, so, so these are our, our generating functions. And now when you know that, that you can use you, you can use the theory of Jack polynomials to, to rewrite it. This is what you've got. So, okay, for me, it's easy to show you because I already know that, but it was really an insight of Golden and Jackson to figure out 
that you can do it this way. And if you look at, if you look at this formula, well, there is an obvious way to, I mean, there is one thing you can, you can do, namely you can just replace this zero and one by, by, by B, right? So by, 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 by parameter. So, so essentially you just take arbitrary Jack polynomials and, and okay, and you know that in these two particular cases, you either count orientable maps or maps on all surfaces. So there is this, there is this question, what's happening if you take arbitrary Jack polynomials? And, and this is a very beautiful conjecture. I, I think it's, it's not very well known. So I, I would really like to promote it, prom promote it as much as possible. Uh, and it's still open. So the conjecture says that if you look at this one parameter deformation of this generating function, this is still a generating function of non-oriented maps. But, but now there is a very mysterious parameter here. here. So you should count your maps with b to a certain exponent. And this exponent is zero if and only if your map is orientable. So this is, this is of course, an, a natural condition. I mean, you, you need this condition because you know that for b equal to zero, everything uh, non-orientable disappears. But it's, it's completely non-obvious non that, that this is possible. So, so this conjecture is, is still wide open. Um, let, let me show you, let me show you how this, this function looks like. So, so I'm gonna expand it uh, with respect to parameter T. So param parameter T is telling you what is the number of edges in your maps, yes. Yes, so, so, so the conjecture says that, that if you look at this generating function, so this generating function is defined here, then this is a generating function of maps on orientable and non-orientable surfaces. And every map that appears, you count it with a, with a certain, you count it, so, so it is counted by a statistic, some, some mysterious statistic, which we call measure of non-orientability. We call it like that because it is equal to zero if and only if your map is orientable. But it's, but we don't know what is this, mysterious measure of non-orientability. So yeah, right. So, so, so let's look at this, at this generating function. So, uh, so there's only one bipartite map with one edge. Um, so nothing, nothing interesting is happening here. Uh, these are all bipartite maps with two edges. Um, so this little arrow, I remind you, it, it's the routing. So I'm, I'm counting rooted, rooted maps. Um, so these three maps, they, they correspond to, to these monomials. And this map is a map, a non-orientable non map, and it corresponds to this one. So it has to have a, it has to have a measure of non-orientability one. This is a map on the projective plane. Okay, and this is, the, this is the, the next term. So now these are all bipartite maps, maps with three edges. Um, and okay, some of them are orientable. So all of them are orientable. They correspond to this part. All these guys are maps which are on the pr projective plane and they must correspond to this term. So their measure of non-orientability is one, but here's something very, very, very weird is happening. So if you look at this, if you look at this, you see that that one map it has it's it, one map is orientable. It's this one, so it has to have measure of non-orientability one. But then there are three maps. It is essentially the same map, but they are different only because of routings. But two of them has measure of non-orientability two, and one of them has measure of non-orientability one. That's something really weird because it seems like this measure of non-orientability. It's not a natural thing to do. It's it's not it, it's not a non-root. It's not a map invariant because the root the root is really changing this measure of non-orientability. So something absolutely weird is happening here. Um, yes. So this is one way to to associate this, this measure of non-orientability. So as as I said, many special cases are proved. So there there are a lot of papers. Uh, which which proves some some special cases of the B conjecture, but 
but it's still wide open in, in, in full generality. Um, so, so if you look at this, at this generating function, um, but I'm going back to, to a classical case. So I don't have jack polynomials any, anymore. I'm, I'm, I have only sure, sure symmetric functions. And if I keep only two first families uh, infinite, but for all the other polynomials, I make a substitution where all the p's are equal to one variable u, then it turns out that this function is something that people were studying a lot in, in, in various areas of mathematics. So this is a very fundamental object in, enum in enumerative geometry. Uh, one reason for that is that this is a, this is a tau function of the Toda hierarchy. Uh, so, so this function is very important and, and it appears in many different areas of mathematics and mathematical physics. Um, so, okay, you lose, you lose some information, but, but then it turns out that this function is, has very strong properties. Um, so it has, a, it has a combinatorial interpretation uh, which generalizes this bipartite picture. So you, you, can, you can interpret it as a generating function of something which is called K constellations. So, so K constellation is a, is a map which has labeled vertices and, and these vertices are labeled in a way that when K is equal to one, this is precisely a bipartite map. And when, when K is bigger, it's something a bit more general. There are some constraints on these labels, but it has a, it has a nice combinatorial interpretation. So, okay, so inspired by, by Golden and Jackson's insight, uh, we decided to ask, can we say something about the deformation of this tau function? So, so this is on one hand side, it's a more general object. On the other hand side, it's less general object because we have this specialization. It's something different, but, but but we can we, we hope that it should have a very similar uh, interpretation. So this is our main theorem. So we were able to to build a geometric uh, picture which generalizes uh, branched cover coverings, such that such that this generating function is a such that this tau function is a generating function of of these branched coverings. So this is stated in a in a geometric in a geometric jargon, but probably it's much better to switch to a more combinatorial picture. Um, so, so we proved that, that this function is a generating function of something that we call also K constellation, but now they can be orientable or non-orientable. Um, so our model is slightly different than classical K constellations in orientable case. It has, for instance, it has less obvious symmetries, um, but it's not a very complicated thing. So what is this K constellation? So, so this is a map and this map has labeled vertices. And vertices are, are labeled by, uh, by numbers from zero to K. And, and there are some local constraints. So, so a vertex zero and the vertex K, they, they, this, these two look, look very similar. Namely, they have only neighbors for this guy only once and for this guy only K minus once, but all the other vertices, so vertices from one to K minus one, they have neighbors I plus one and I minus one such that it alternates around, around the vertices. Th this is our model. It's not terribly complicated. You can see that when k is equal to one, this thing doesn't appear. So this is just a bipartite map. Um, so what we proved, we proved that this, this tau function is a generating function of these guys. And it is, it is indeed given by, so there, there exists this measure of non-orientability such that this is a generating function of these guys with respect to the measure of non-orientability. Non and here we are able to track two infinite fa families of, of parameters, namely the first family of P's. Uh, it tells you what are the degrees of faces in your model. And the second family tells you what are the degrees of 
verti of these vertices. So these special vertices which have label zero. And then all the other vertices, we cannot, we, we cannot know what are their degrees, but we know what is their number. So, so the exponent of ith variable tells you what is the number of, of vertices with label i. Um, so, okay, so, so what's the idea of the proof of this theorem? Um, so, so, okay, there are like, there are two sides. So what makes it the jack? The jack case is much more difficult than the sure case because basically we don't have representation theory. So that's the main, that's the main problem. Um, so we have these two sides. One side is a map, map world, and, and the second side is a, is a symmetric functions world. So, so, so the first thing that we do is, is like we ask some experts in maps what to do, and what they typically do, they're removing an edge from a map and they're looking what's going to happen. So this was an idea of Tat. Um, this, this was an original idea of Tat who was able to produce some functional equation for the gener generating function of planar maps. And for higher genus, uh, it was Lehman and Walsh who, who first uh, did the same, they had the same idea. And if your generating function is not too complicated, let's say you just want to track the number of vertices and number of, of edges, you can do this. It's much harder to control the degrees of, of vertices and things like that, but it's still doable. So in, okay, in, in other model, we have this weird constraints on labels, but okay, if you work hard, it's still possible to do this. So we, we were able to, to remove these edges in some particular way, and we were able to produce a certain differential equation which is satisfied by the, by the generating function of, of these maps. So, so, okay, so we produce this, this partial differential equation, and, and then we wanted to show that also if you take the definition of this tau function, which is given by Jack polynomials, it satisfies the same partial differential equation. That's, that's the idea. So, so you can, you can still produce a partial differential equation. Um, and what you do, you basically use a fundamental fact in the field due to Richard Stanley, that Jack polynomials are eigenfunctions of, eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operator. Um, so, so then you have to play a lot with Pierre rules and, and you need to use some nested uh, commutators of some differential operator. Uh, this is something that Michel Lasalle was this type of, of, of uh, differential equation was were produced by Michel Lasalle, so we were inspired by this. We were able to, pr to produce the second partial differential equation. And the problem was that these two partial differential, differential equations, they looked completely different. So we were hoping to, to prove that, you know, that you have a left-hand side and right-hand side, it satisfies the same partial differential equation and we're done. And the problem is that these two partial differential equations, they look completely different. The miracle is that they're at the same. And this was the hardest part of the proof. So proving that these two par partial differential equations are the same, it was, it was a pain. It basically took us two years, but, but okay, but, but we made it. So this is how, this is how the proof works, um, essentially. Um, About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So, so then I want to I want to tell you something about weighted Hurwitz numbers. Um, so, so there is this this. So I told you that we are studying this uh, this specialization, and this specialization it has a very compact compact formula. So this is a compact formula which uh, involves contents of a box. So a content it's 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 drawn here on this picture. You, you basically you rotate your young diagram 45 degrees uh, counterclockwise, and you look on the on the position of your box uh, on the projection on on the x line. So this this is a box, uh, and then there is a formula. There is a product formula for for the specialization. Uh, so so the corollary is that actually this this tau function it has a very very nice. There is a very nice formula, um, and Mathieu, together with John Harnett, they, they, they defined something which is called a weighted Hurwitz numbers. So, so 
So I will show you again. So here we have just the, the product here. So, so now you're just replacing this product by, by basically any, any reasonable function G. Um, so, okay, what, why not? You can do this. Um, you can, and then you define something, you define weighted Her Hurwitz numbers. The good thing about this weighted Hurwitz numbers is that this definition covers a lot of special cases, which were so far, they were, they were studied completely separately. So for instance, if you take uh, exponential function, you, you've got uh, double Hurwitz numbers. Uh, if you take this function, you have bipartite maps. And also if you take this function, we've got monotone Hurwitz numbers that Jonathan was talking about yesterday. Um, so, so we did the same thing uh, with our B-deformed uh, tau function. Uh, and then the theorem is that, I mean, everything works pretty much the same. Mm, so, and this is almost for free. I mean, to, to got this theorem from the previous one, this is almost for free. So the previous one is really the most important result. Uh, so this means that, that we can define this G-weighted be the from Hurwitz numbers. Um, and then this, this still has a very nice combinatorial interpretation. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's a generating function of, of, of this, uh, constellations where well, they're not constellations anymore. They're, they're, they're models of Hurwitz numbers. So there are infinite constellations, but these are some te technicalities, but essentially it has a nice, the message is that it has a nice combinatorial interpretation. Um, so I want to tell you something about this partial differential equations that I mentioned before. I said that this, this function was very important because it's a, it's a tau function of Toda hierarchy. Um, and this is also a tau function of the KP hierarchy. Uh, so what is this KP hierarchy? This is, this is an, an infinite system of partial differential equations. It comes from physics. So it was discovered by, by Kadontsev and Patriash Fili. They were studying some colliding ocean waves. Uh, so this is how it originally uh, arose, but it turned out that that this KP hierarchy is a beautiful thing that, that naturally appears in enumerative geometry. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so for instance, um, there, is this, there is this theorem. Uh, so for, uh, for Hurwitz numbers is due to Okunkov and Orlov and uh, for, for bipartite maps and for maps, it's, uh, it's a beautiful paper of, of Gulden and Jackson. Uh, and in general, for weighted Hurwitz numbers, this is a result of, uh, of John and Mathieu. Uh, so in all these cases, this, this tau function is a, is a tau function of this infinite hierarchy of partial differential equations. So this means that this, means that this tau function, it satisfies infinitely many di partial differential equations. Um, so, okay, this is, this is quite interesting. So for instance, the fact that this tau function satisfies KP, it was used by Kazarian and Lando to prove uh, a famous Witten Konsevich theorem. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting, very interesting thing. And there is a natural question. So can we, is, is there anything, is there anything similar in this, in this general case, uh, in this, in this one parameter deformation? So, okay, for like for general B, we were talking with mathematical physicists. It seems that there is no hope or at least no one knows what to do. Or, but, but there may be some special cases. Uh, maybe, maybe there is something interesting when B is non-zero. Um, and, and actually for B equal one, there is something. So it turns out that when, you, when we take B equal to one, then a very special case of this, of this tau function it's just a, this is just a generating function of Gaussian beta ensembles of, of so, so this result is, let's say that it's essentially due to Okunkov who, who, who proved that you can interpret Gaussian beta ensembles as, as this function. There was also Michael Lacroix who, who wrote it down in his thesis precisely, but, uh, but yeah, so this very special case, uh, is related with matrix models. So, so this is related with the generating function of 
for arbitrary beta for Gaussian beta ensembles and for B equal one, this is related with, uh, with random symmetric mat matrices. Um, and then we knew that, that there is something which is called the BKP hierarchy. It's a different, different hierarchy of partial differential equations. And it was proved by Van der Lerre that, uh, that this particular matri matrix model the tau function, the, the generating function of these matrix models is a tau function of the BKP Kirk. So that was a start for, for, for our problem. And we, we proved that, that if you take this um, generating function of bipartite maps on orientable or non-orientable surfaces, this is also a tau function of the BKP Kirk. But, but, but this theorem is basically, this is just Vandeleur. Like, like we didn't do anything really new. So, uh, so it, it more or less, it follows from, from Van der Lerre, uh, work. Um, but then, but then the question is, so what about other, what about other models? So for instance, we, we checked K greater than one and it turned out that this is not a tau function of BKP Kirky. So the situation is completely different than for B equals zero where we know that all weighted Hurwitz numbers, like the tau function of all weighted Hurwitz numbers is a tau function of KP. But here it seems that something, something completely different is happening and only very special cases uh, has this BKP hierarchy. So we ask if there is something, if there is something else and there are these monotone Hurwitz numbers that Jonathan was, was telling you about yesterday. Uh, and so, okay, this is a very quick reminder of what we saw yesterday. So there's these two famous uh, integrals. The first is a harsh Hundra is consumer integral. And the second one is um, Bresan gross witten integral. Um, and these are integrals over unitary group. Um, and, and there are some compact formulas for these, for these integrals. So, so the first integral is given by, a it has a determinant of formula. Uh, so this is essentially due to harsh Hundra and it's six and Zuber was they were working independently on on this, um, and the second formula. So I will attribute it to Mironov, Morozov, Semenov, but but maybe it's wrong. Um, but there's also a determinantal formula for this BG, BGW model, um, and then there is a theorem that we saw yesterday that that the topological expansion of this of these two. Uh, integrals is given by monotone Hurwitz numbers. So, so we looked at this B deformed monotone Hurwitz numbers and we're wondering if there is something similar. And then we actually discovered that, that our definition, it coincides with a definition uh, given by, by physicists, Bresan and Hikami. Uh, so, so they were studying beta deformation of HCIZ integral, and it is exactly it corresponds to our B monotone Hurwitz numbers. So, so for instance, it means that our theorem that I showed you before it gives you a topological uh, expansion of this of this beta uh, of this beta deformation of these integrals, and and an interesting thing is happening when B is equal to one because then these int int integrals are very concrete. So these are integrals on uh, on over orthogonal group. Um, and the question is the same. So is it true that, that this integral is a tau function of the BKP hierarchy? And our main theorem is yes. Uh, so this is what we proved. So remember that B is equal to one. So this means that Jack polynomial became this zonal polynomial. So this is a very concrete formula for this, for this tau function. In this case, this is how it looks like. And, and we proved that this is a tau function of the BKP hierarchy. And an interesting thing is that our proof is absolutely completely different than the proof of Van der Lerre. Um, so there is a very nice consequence of this. Um, namely, we have a nice compact formula for, for this integral, for this BGW integral over orthogonal group. And I just want to tell you very quickly, what's the problem if you want to use, if you want to use a Harish Kandra formula. So Harish Kandra uh, wor was working on, on a very in a very, very general setup. So 
he was working on uh, on the theory of, of Lie group, um, and he proved that that this is this is a formula which is quite general. But if you want to apply to a very concrete setup, so for instance, if you want to take a unitary group, that then it turns out that that the Lie group is, are all matrices. So these external matrices which appear in this in this uh, Harish Chandra eight six on Zuber integral, they can be arbitrary. But the problem is if you take orthogonal group, then then the Lie group are their matrices, their anti sorry, their anti symmetric matrices. Um, but for physicists, this is not very interesting because physicists would like to know what is the formula if you integrate over orthogonal group, but your external matrices are arbitrary. So, so this, this Harish Chandra formula doesn't tell you too much uh, because your Lie group is very special. Uh, so for instance, uh, this is what Einard wrote in one of his hip, one of his paper. He said that in this business, basically uh, one of the very important problem is to understand what's happening when these external matrices are arbitrary and not necessarily anti-symmetric. And, and we have this theorem, which is a corollary of this one that that there is a there is a very concrete um, formula for this for this integral, in some kind of in some funny case, namely when the spectrum is doubled. So we we don't really understand what's happening here. I mean, it's a, it's a nice corollary, but we, I would say that we are far from from full understanding on on what's happening here. So uh, so this is my last slide. So 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 yeah, there are many things to to understand. So for instance. This is one formula that, that follows from this. This is one formula that we use to prove this BKP. And we proved it in, in a not very nice way, in a, in a, in a sense that we, we kind of guessed the formula. And again, we proved that, that it's okay because it satisfies certain constraints. But you know, this formula is very concrete and I would like to understand, I would like to understand what this, why this formula holds true. Um, and also, why we have only these special cases with this BKP? So th this is also, this is weird. I mean, uh, we expect that this is probably related with this matrix models uh, thing, but we don't have a very good understanding of that. Um, and most import importantly, I will, I will go back to the beginning of, of my talk. So, okay, we were able to go a bit further from, from the B conjecture, and we were able to, to investigate some, some new di directions, but Unfortunately, the B conjecture is still open. So, so, so this is a very, very beautiful conjecture that, that I need your help because I don't know what to do. So thank you very much. And it was a pleasure to be here. I think in the interest of time to get back for lunch, maybe we'll defer questions to, uh, you can meet with uh, Metric through the conference. We'll see you after lunch. Thanks again.